Hello, hello, hello. My name is Tom Tuck, which is actually my real name. My name is Tom Tuck, and I am a person. <laughs> my name is Tom Tuck, and I'm a person, neither a fairy tale character nor a minorly invasive surgical procedure. <laughs> And I'm here to talk to you about films. Do we like films? Yeah. Good, good, good. Do we like Disney films? Yeah. Do we like Disney straight to DVD films? Yeah. Well, basically, I'm trying to watch every single Disney straight to DVD movie so that you don't have to. You're welcome. There are 54 of these films. And that sounds like too many, doesn't it? But I've come to the realisation that numbers are only really about context. Because if you say to someone, I have 54, they will say, of what? That bit definitely matters. <laughs> I have 54 notches on a bedpost. That sounds like too many. I have 54 pence. That is not enough. <laughs> For this coffee, please leave. Three sounds like a tiny little number. Three? But in context, it might not, because if you say to someone, I have three Ricky Martin albums, and it sounds like too many. It sounds like too many, doesn't it? It's not, but three sounds like too many for one man to have, like pork pies in a day or rasta hats. <laughs> and there are 54 of these films. There are 54 of them because I've set the rules as to what counts. I mean, because you've got to have rules before there can be any fun. <laughs> It's got to be animated, it's got to be Disney, it's got to have not had a cinematic release in either this country or in America. Does anyone know what the, uh, the first Disney STD was? <laughs> Sorry, that's my acronym, I should fill you in. STD stands for straight to DVD, it's very clever. Um, actually, someone pointed out to me that the D in my acronym actually stands for DVD, which is an acronym itself. <laughs> we'll be caught in an infinite regression before long. And so I've changed it, it's got to be STD, VD. <laughs> Does anyone know what the, um, the first Disney ST DVD was? It was Return of Jafar, the, uh, the sequel to Aladdin. And uh, it marked the first point at which Disney thought, you know what, we could use the same characters and fleece parents. <laughs> but they made some mistakes in the actual making of the film. <laughs> the first mistake they made is, is they give two out of the first three songs to Iago the Parrot. <laughs> And whatever you can say about Gilbert Gottfried, the actor who plays Iago the Parrot, he's not a natural singer. <laughs> Just forget about love! And that's grating to an adult ear, let alone the unformed ones it's technically meant for. And the second mistake they made was they've got a sort of comedy Arab sidekick in it, and they've given him a name that's almost certainly racist, but he's also a critique of the film as a whole. And you think, how have you managed that, Disney? You're a massive organisation! You must have had meetings. What should we call our comedy Arab sidekick? Shall we give him an Arabic name? No. <laughs> Just give him a name that sounds a bit Arabic. <laughs> right, well, uh, like what? <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> Just make one up. Well, off the top of my head, how's Ab Ismail? <laughs> Abysmal. <laughs> Perfect. How did they manage to do that? And then the worst thing they did is they don't get Robin Williams back. Like Robin Williams is a big tick next to Aladdin 1, aka Aladdin. Um, <laughs> instead of Robin Williams, they have Dan Castellaneta, the voice of Homer Simpson, doing a Robin Williams impression. Only it's a Robin Williams impression when Robin Williams hasn't had any cocaine. When Robin Williams is sticking to a script. And nobody wants that. Nobody wants that, least of all children. They don't know why they want a coked up blue guy, they just really feel the lack. <laughs> now, I've learnt a lot whilst doing this, chiefly about the portrayal of women in Disney films, because it seems to have never changed. <laughs> From time immemorial, or the 40s, <laughs> women in Disney films have been perfect and beautiful and virtuous. And the men have gone very rapidly from hero to chump. <laughs> Jasmine, in Aladdin, for instance, like, she's perfect and beautiful and virtuous, and the only time she does anything wrong is she's went under the influence of a magic stick. 
But Aladdin, Aladdin himself, he's a liar and a thief, and at one point he's cruel to a monkey. <laughs> and he still gets the girl. George Bernard Shaw once said, it is only through fiction that fact can be made instructive, or indeed even intelligible. I got my heart broken by a girl. Her name is Shannon. I'm, I'm not going to tell you her surname, because it is genuinely still my password for everything. <laughs> While we were still at school, I asked her out many, many, many times. In context, too many times. <laughs> she said no an equivalent number of times. Until one day I asked her out whilst we were playing badminton. Mixed doubles. I don't remember who was on the other side of the net. I asked her out to the prom. I went to an American school, I wasn't just being pretentious. <laughs> and she said yes. And then I said the worst two words you can say in that situation. Thank you. <laughs> she changed her mind. <laughs> A couple of weeks later, in an ill-advised attempt to win back her affection, I told her she had powerful thighs. <laughs> Have you seen Little Mermaid 2? Colon Return to the Sea. I mean, if you've not seen it, you'll be really surprised to hear it's not a good film. It's basically, Little Mermaid 2 is the same film as the first one, but backwards. So you know at the end of the first one, she's uh, living in the castle with Prince Eric and legs. Like, in two, she's still in the castle, but now she's got a daughter. And then, because of some plot, the child's not allowed to go swimming. And then it's a child being banned from doing something, so now it really wants to go swimming. So it sneaks off and does a swimming and meets a semi-fish and blah, blah. Horrible! <laughs> but Little Mermaid 3 is beyond reproach. <laughs> The amount of Sebastian backstory. <sighs> it's a prequel. Little Mermaid 3, colon. Ariel's beginnings! And because of some plot, music is under prohibition. And our hero crab takes it upon himself to found an underground and indeed underwater music venue, where he is both band leader and main singer. And that's the exact plot of We Will Rock You. <laughs> and stealing that is one of Ben Elton's lesser crimes. Even though he did write it first. <laughs> I've learned a word while doing this. Midquel. Do you know the word midquel? There's prequels and there's sequels. I'll give you an example. Tarzan 2 takes place during a song in Tarzan 1. <laughs> that's efficiency, isn't it? <laughs> The other midquel I should tell you about is uh, Fox and the Hound 2. Uh, obviously, it can't be a sequel, otherwise it'd just be called And the Hound. Spoiler alert! Um, <laughs> but Fox and the Hound 2 is really good. Uh, Patrick Swayze's in it. And Reba McIntyre's in it, for any country music fans in the room. And um, she plays a sassy dog. <laughs> Basically, Reba McIntyre's sassy dog gets kicked out of the band. And she has this long, slow, moonlit walk where she sings a song that shouldn't be allowed for children. <laughs> Good doggy. No bone. You can't say that! <laughs> you just... Not even a little bitty bone. Stop it! Stop wagging your sassy dog to begin with! This is only meant for children! Yes, I know I've bought a copy. Yes, I am CRB checked. <laughs> So I got my heart broken by a girl. Her name is Megan Strad. And I, I'm willing to tell you her full name uh, because she's Australian and therefore barely a person. <laughs> Come on, they get married near cooking meat. <laughs> but, but I was besotted with this Australian. We were 12 or 13 and we were trekking in the Himalayas. I went to school in Bangladesh, it was a short hop. And we snuck away from where everyone else was eating to sit on some rocks by a stream and look at each other. And it was the most romantic moment of my life. So dark and so far away from any human incandescent light. 
and I was certain it was going to be my first kiss. But looking back, I didn't properly know what kissing was. I kind of thought it was pressing slash rubbing faces. But I was delighted that that was about to happen. I was an odd child. I was the kind of child who only had two posters in their bedroom. One, and in retrospect, deeply homoerotic poster of Axl Rose. <laughs> Top off, black and white, crucifix, hint of pube. And the other was a geopolitical map of Western Europe. <laughs> with cocktail stick flags in all the cities I'd been to and enjoyed a burger. And I looked at Megan and Megan looked at me. And she said, what do you want to do, Thomas? And I presumed she wanted to do what I wanted to do, press slash rub faces. So I said, you know what I want to do. And she said, I'm not gonna have sex with you, Thomas, I'm 12. <laughs> have you seen Lady and the Tramp too? Colon Scamp's Adventure. Well, basically, Lady and Tramp, they have a child and he's called Scamp. Can you guess what he's like? Yeah, he's really naughty. Oh, he's super naughty. He goes on an adventure where he's really naughty. Oh, nominative determinism. But it's quite good. But there are moments of it that really jar. Because any time anything with wheels or gears comes on screen, it's done in really shonky CGI. It's just kind of dropped on the rest of the film. He's like, that's not allowed. It's like if you're watching a Mike Lee film, and in between crying into cups of tea, the characters stop to feed a cartoon cat. And it's like, oh! It reminds you of how little of a toss they give about some of these films. It's like that bit in Beauty and the Beast 3, Bell's Magical World. Have you all seen Beauty and the Beast 1? Yeah, yeah it's good, isn't it? Like, if you haven't seen Beauty and the Beast 1, there's a spell on the castle, which means the prince is a beast, and all of his staff are now things. So there's the one who's a candelabra, there's the one who's a clock, and there's Chip the teacup. He's a teacup with a chip on his rim. And then when he turns back to human, he's got a chip in his teeth. I thought he was going to be severely brain damaged. <laughs> How will Mrs. Potts come? <laughs> and at the end of the film, the spell is broken, but nobody warns them. Goes like, ding, 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 get ready to become a human again now. So some of the things will just be being good things in cupboards, and they're like exploding back into human form, putting their arm through the head of what was very recently a spoon, and the blood will be running down the cabinets, and any logical child would think that. Any logical child. There's one who's a chandelier that is hanging or dropped from a height. She is dead either way. <laughs> But there's a bit in Beauty and the Beast 3, Bell's Magical World, where she's walking down a corridor with a clock, and they've animated her in such a way as you look at the screen and go, you haven't seen anyone do anything ever, have you? <laughs> she's leaning at, like, more than 45 degrees, and her arms swinging back and forth, and her hand flips up ludicrously at the end of each parabola. You're like, what? How? How have you managed to animate the clock walking convincingly and not the woman? <laughs> see the latter three Christs of a lot more often. And I thought, no, they don't. They are animators. They rarely see women do anything. <laughs> the CGI problem also besets Beauty and the Beast 2, uh, the Enchanted Christmas, because the baddie in that, the nemesis, is a, a massive, nasty, big, bad CGI organ. Like a piano with pipes on a wall. It's not very scary. <laughs> but he, he's the main antagonist. And at no point in the film does anyone go, shall we just shut the door? <laughs> Have you seen Cinderella 2? Colon, dreams come true. Uh, uh, if you didn't hear that title, Cinderella 2, colon, dreams come true. Now, is anyone naive enough like me to think that the dream already came true? There was only point in the first one! <laughs> it turns out her dream is admin. <laughs> She gets to organise a ball. <laughs> Cinderella 3 is better than it has any right to be. It is not a promising title to start. Cinderella 3, colon, a quantum of solace. <laughs> I, I, I got my heart broken by a girl. Her name is Beth. Uh, I'm not going to tell you her surname because she's seen the show and politely requests that I don't. I was in love with Beth since pretty much the first moment I met her. Certainly since the moment I bought an unwise round of 30 shots to impress her. 
I drank 11 of them. I've got the T-shirt to prove it. But the affections weren't immediately reciprocated. It took a few months. It took a few months and very specifically two hours. Two hours at my birthday party, flirting using that perennially sexy medium of magnetic fridge poetry. But it worked and we snuck away. But we were discovered by my flatmate, which was awkward because he also fancied her. He caught us in flagrante. Well, like, not like totally flagrante. So like hands and like flagra. <laughs> and we embarked upon quite an intense relationship. It, it was intense because we always knew it was destined to be truncated. Because at the end of the year, she was due to go to France for a year because of some plot. <laughs> I thought we'd have our teary goodbyes. Instead, we had our first and only fight. And I have no idea what it was about. I only remember two things about the night. One, at the beginning of the evening, there was definitely some homemade cider there. <laughs> and two, the phrase, it's not all about you, Thomas. <laughs> and she used my full name. She used my full name like a mother holding shards of a vase. <laughs> and that was it at, at least I, I thought it was because last summer which was seven years after that event we actually guys guys I think just no music we drunkenly and stupidly rekindled that particular flame no no it's, it's just overly manipulative I don't think I've ever cried during sex before. <laughs> Things I knew why I was so emotional. It was because I had her back in my arms. It's because the universe had seen fit to commission a sequel. <laughs> Beth and the Tramp 2. <laughs> Colon Tom cries on her tits. <laughs> I, I, I sort of knew right there and then that it wasn't going to last. Because all I could focus on, all I could focus on was the fact that she'd altered her topiary. <laughs> Are we on the same page? <laughs> it was like the tide had gone out. <laughs> all beach. <laughs> and I just thought, I didn't want you to change at all. I want you to have stayed exactly the same. You wouldn't have changed if Walt had drawn you. <laughs> Who's seen Simba's Pride? Yeah, it's not a patch on Lion King 3. <laughs> oh my goodness, if Lion King 1 is Hamlet, which it definitely is, <laughs> then Lion King 3 is Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. <laughs> it's Timon and Pumbaa's parallel story. And it's also the most meta thing that's ever been put deliberately in front of children. Because <laughs> the beginning of Lion King 3, Timon and Pumba are watching Lion King 1 <laughs> in a cinema, in a film that didn't get a cinema release. And then they pause it, presumably they're busy mates with the projectionist. <laughs> and they say, let's tell everybody about what we did. Presumably there was a second unit director on the first one, <laughs> but it bumbles along sort of nice and fine. It's, it's quite funny. You learn a lot of the backstage antics because, you know, when the, the giraffe bows down and those zebras bow down, they all bow down. It's because Pumba did a fart. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're watching this with a child and it gets to what should be the end and you will know, just press eject and make the child walk away because it gets too weird. <laughs> Cuts back to the cinema, Timon and Pumper are now watching the credits of Lion King 1. And then a silhouette comes in. And you just think to yourself, no. No, it can't be. <laughs> they wouldn't dare. But they did. It's Mickey. <laughs> it's Mickey and I don't even like him in his own films. <laughs> What does Mickey's Twice Upon a Christmas even mean? He's followed by Minnie and then Donald and then Goofy. 
And then from the other side, the silhouette of a woman and seven little silhouetted hats. And they shouldn't be allowed to cross-pollinate these things! It's really confusing to me. And I've got a degree. Admittedly, it's a tutu in philosophy. But then all the other silhouettes go, Oh, did we miss Lion King? Can we watch it again? Yeah, the perfect scam. The only reason anyone's bought Lion King 3 is so they can stop watching Lion King 1 with a child. And at the end of this perfectly adequate replacement device that the loving parent has bought, it pumps into their impressionable mind, watch Lion King 1 again. <laughs> and they'll do it! They'll do it! They're really easy to program. Teach. They're really easy to teach. <laughs> Lion King 1 again, and after they've watched Lion King 1 again, they'll remember, go, oh yeah, what about all those backstage antics in Lion King 3? So they'll watch Lion King 3 of their own volition. Then they'll be told to watch Lion King 1 again. Then they'll want to watch Lion King 3 again, Lion King 1 again, Lion King 3 again, Lion King 1 again, Lion King 3 again, Lion King 1 again, Lion King 3 again, 1, 3, 1, 3, 1, 3, and that's the circle of life. I got my heart broken by a girl, but I'm not comfortable speaking about it on stage, so I've uh, written a fairy tale. Once upon a time, there was a beautiful princess. Princess Catherine. She lived in a white castle. She spent all her time in the tower. She wasn't locked in, but she used to sleep for 23 hours a day. No one really knew why. She used to say it was because she had a crack in her heart, a flaw, a fissure. Her parents, the king and queen, didn't believe her. And no doctor in the realm could diagnose her. So she went on sleeping for 23 hours a day. One day, a man was walking past. Let's, let's call him Tommy Tucker. <laughs> He saw the white castle. He saw the tower. He saw the ivy leading up to her window. And he climbed up the ivy and into the window and he kissed the princess on the forehead. Because he'd heard that that helped. And she woke up. And as their eyes met, he could tell that something was wrong. He said, have you got a crack in your heart? A flaw? A fissure? She said, yeah. He said, how did you get that? She said, no one's ever asked that before. He said, well, tell me. She said, lean in. So he did. And she told him. And then she said, I've, I've got to go back to sleep now. And she did. And when she was asleep, he took her heart out of her body. And he tended to it for 23 hours. And he put it back in her body and kissed her on the forehead. And that day she was able to stay awake for a little bit longer. And he did this day after day after day until Princess Catherine was able to stay awake for a normal amount of time. And do all the things a, a normal princess would do. Admin. <laughs> and she grew stronger. And she grew braver. Until one day she was so strong and, and so brave she was able to push him out of a window and like shack up with another prince. And then that prince sent him loads of really abusive emails. And it was... <laughs> Her real name is Catherine and she got married to somebody else. Uh, we had been engaged, white golden diamond since you ask. <laughs> But she got married to someone else and they had a child, they had a kid. And uh, the kid was recently one and she put loads of photos on Facebook of the child in a hat. <laughs> and I looked at the photos and I just thought, oh, that child. That child should be mine. <laughs> I've got a lot of films to show it. And I've tried to work out why I seem to fall in love at the drop of a hat and why people drop so many hats near me. <laughs> I think I've figured it out. 
I think if someone just lets me talk at them for a bit, I'll fall in love with them. <laughs> just lets me talk at Listening, that's what they call it. <laughs> and so in a very real sense, I love all of you. <laughs> but I know you'll leave. <laughs> I think my point is this. There's no such thing as a flawed genre. There are gems to be found in the STDVD canon. <laughs> Does it matter that they're no one's favourite film? No one likes them that much. Barely anyone knows they exist. Aware that that's a sombre ending to a comedy show, let's have a sing-song. <laughs> do join in if you know the words. Look at this stuff. Isn't it neat? <laughs> Wouldn't you think my collection's complete? Wouldn't you think I'm the girl, the girl who has everything? Sing up. <laughs> I want to be where the people are. And I want to see you, want to see them dancing. Walking around on those... What do you call them? Feet! Flipping your fins, you don't get too far. Legs are required for jumping, dancing, strolling along down a... What's that word again? Straight! Straight. Tuck Goes Straight to DVD was written and performed by me, Tom Tuck, with music from Martin White, Amy Butterworth and Ben Handysides. The producer was Leanne Coop. <laughs> <laughs>